It's great to be back on my home turf. I lived here off and on for probably 15 years, so uh, this does indeed feel like home. In fact, I spent a good part of today wandering around, taking in the sights, uh, recognizing all the houses where friends of mine had lived, the places that I had lived. So um, yeah, this is great. And also, I remembered that uh, the mascot of the public schools is the Bears. So this is cool and appropriate. Um, so anyway, glad to be here. Glad to talk about grizzly bears, which is a species that I'm especially keen on. Um, I started in studying grizzly bears in uh, the Yellowstone ecosystem back in 1979. Uh, so it's been a focus of my life. Grizzly bears have been a focus of my life for however long that is, about 40 years at this point. Um, and this is a, a talk that I've enjoyed putting together because it is of a more positive and aspirational nature. It seems like of late, many of the talks that I've given have been in the more like critiques of existing grizzly bear management, grizzly bear research. But this is about a positive vision, at least what I would hope would be a positive vision for a lot of people, because it's about restoring what we once had in this part of the world. Um, so I'm talking in part about grizzly bears for the clear water drainage, but more broadly, grizzly bears beyond the Great Divide. And what I mean by that is this area shaded in yellow, basically everything west of the Continental Divide. And one distinguishing feature of the Great Beyond, as I'm calling it, is that it is either under-occupied by grizzly bears or unoccupied by grizzly bears, and that's despite there being, as, Grizz, as Gary noted, a lot of potential. And so my thesis here will be that as long as we let grizzly bears get here with their own feet, survive to get here, they will flourish and we will have a burgeoning grizzly bear population. And that's because of the native existing potential in terms of productivity and also remoteness from people. Um, uh, as I was implying, by the fact that I'd lived here for a number of years. I'm not unfamiliar with this part of the world. Um, spent a lot of time running around in uh, the Clearwater, um, the northern part of Idaho more, more broadly into northwestern Montana, and also had the pleasure of collaborating with somebody on Grizzly Bear Research Focus, somebody that you may know, Troy Merrill, who's in the audience here. Um, we embarked on a number of investigations, in fact, trying to identify where the potential suitable habitat might be in this part of the world. And this is just a sampler of the publications that we produced with that specific focus. So I'm going to draw, draw in part on these publications also a lot of other research that's been done. So starting out with perhaps the obvious, and this may seem like a no-brainer, just that we did, in fact, have lots of grizzly bears at one point in time beyond the Great Divide. Now, I'm emphasizing that we did because there have been those at various points in time who have argued that we had few grizzly bears in this part of the world, and some who have claimed that there were no grizzly bears in this part of the world, but in fact, there were. And we know that from a lot of lines of evidence. For example, first-hand accounts by people like William Wright. Here's a publication he produced. You can see the publication date is 1909. And in it, he recounts many, many, many encounters with grizzly bears in the clear water drainage, most of them ending up like this. So this is a photo from his book of a sow and a couple of cubs that he happened to kill. We also know there were lots of grizzly bears in this part of the world from Bud Moore's book in it as well. He documents many encounters with grizzly bears. And in his case, not as often ending up fatal, but in this instance, we have one of the last bears shot in the clear water, barring the one that was shot more re most recently in the 2000s. This was back um, along Kelly Creek, a place appropriately called Bear Wallow Mountain. Also, other first-hand accounts by people such as Enos Mills, but most notably, a guy named C. Hart Merriam, who during the late 1800s into the early 1900s 
was head of the National Biological Survey, and he was a fanatic about grizzly bears. So he was soliciting information from people throughout the West about where we had grizzly bears at that pivotal moment of time. And out of all of this information, he was able to distill the distribution of grizzly bears as it was, say, around 1910. And there's that distribution. Everything in green is where we likely still had grizzly bears around 1910. And notably, this is on the lee side of most of the extirpations that happened. By this point in time, as I'll point out a little later, we had lost about 90% of the bears that we had in the western US and about 90% of the places where they lived. Interestingly, we had a couple grizzly bears still hanging on in the craters of the moon on the Snake River Plain around 1910. But um, more specifically, there are locations that can be, can be identified based on these first-hand accounts. For example, each one of those red dots is derived from these books, an instance where somebody said, I encountered a bear in thus and such a drainage. So that's for the clear water more specifically. Further north, we have lots of documented encounters, locations from the work of people such as Earl Laser, Wayne Caseworm, many more locations up in areas where we still have grizzly bears, up in the Selkirks and Cabinet Yak. So just recently, um, I came across these annual game reports that were produced by the Forest Service between roughly 1920 uh, up to about 1942. And so based on the summary for Region 1 National Forest for 1933, you can actually come up with a population estimate or population estimates for grizzly bears in the Northern Rockies. So here for the Selkirks, about 20, Cabinet Yak, about 55, for the Northern Continental Divide, about 530. Now, interestingly enough, this is near the same number of grizzlies we currently have in those ecosystems, you know, whatever that might signify. But likewise, there was an estimate of 40 still in 1930 hanging on in the Selway Clearwater drainage. So to put this in a little more visual form, a little more concrete form, for example, in the Sapphire Range east of the Bitterroot Valley, up on the ridges, we had probably grizzly bears with their cubs grazing. Along the Selway River, we almost certainly had grizzly bears fishing for spawning salmon. Along the ridges of the Selway country, we had females with their cubs wandering. So we did, in fact, have lots of grizzlies. Now, an important point that I want to make up front is that we could still have lots of grizzlies in this part of the world. So we can do this by first principles. Basically, look at all the places where we don't have people. And one way of reckoning where we have people is to look at road densities. So here, obviously, the darker the shading of the burgundy, the more roads we have. This is for Montana, Idaho, and far northwestern Wyoming. We can also look at what's called the human footprint, which is the extent to which we humans have more or less permanently converted the natural environment to our purposes, either by creating residences, more often by um, developing croplands or other agricultural lands. So obviously the darker the shading towards red, the greater the human impact or footprint. So you sort of take the negative image of that, which is areas that are remote from people, where we could potentially have grizzly bears. And in fact, much of that potential has been realized in the northern continental divide in the Yellowstone ecosystems. But notice, not here. So we can go beyond first principles and draw, in fact, on all the research that's been done, trying to identify where that potential suitable habitat exists. Here looking at productivity remoteness from humans. And there's a lot of it. So I'm not just pulling this out of the air. 
and that's what's been identified as potential suitable, ha suitable habitat, everything that's light green. Now, the deeper the stacking, the darker that green, the greater the replication of results. So the more confident we can be in there indeed being suitable habitat there. So, begs a question, why, given all that potential, why, given the absence of people, the absence of roads, do we have grizzly bears still in the northern continental divide, Yellowstone, Cabinet, Yak, Selkirks, but not in central Idaho? And in fact, I would argue that this huge, vast area of potential could be considered essentially the grizzly bear promised land however you want to take that. So again, why don't we have lots of grizzlies beyond the Great Divide? Well, to answer that question, you've got to go back in history. And I'm going to be a little bit gratuitous about this because I like this topic. So I'm going to be uh, rather loquacious about history, history of grizzly bears. In fact, going way, way back in time to the Ice Ages, to the Pleistocene. So what we're looking at here is North America sort of tipped down toward the bottom of this map. Um, you can see areas covered by ice sheets at that time. This is during the Ice Ages again. You can see Eurasia kind of coming in from the top, connected to North America by a landmass called Beringia. At that time, the ocean levels were lower, that water having been caught up in those ice sheets. A little more orientation. This is pointing north towards the North Pole. This is a pregnant period of time, 70 to 55,000 years ago, because this is when grizzly bears first arrived in North America in eastern Beringia of three different genetic lineages. Their taxonomists, geneticists, phylogenists call them clades. You can think of them as being roughly subspecies, so clades two, three, and four. And it was about this time that there were these fleeting ice-free corridors that opened up between the Cordilleran ice sheet to the west and the Laurentide ice sheet to the east. And it was through one of these corridors that grizzly bears slipped south and established themselves for the first time at mid-latitudes in North America. <clears throat> of the three lineages, only one lineage survived, the clade four grizzly bears. So here's what we had the last glacial maximum about 25,000 years ago. You can see our clade four bears were isolated at mid-latitudes from bears everywhere else. Interestingly, for reasons I'm not going to get into, the bears went extinct up in Beringia. So these were the only bears in North America at the time, grizzly bears. Now stepping back and look at the, at the global scene about that time during the last glacial maximum, everything you see in white were ice sheets. Everything in green is where I've reconstructed we probably had grizzly bears at that time. They were relegated to these refuges, these refugia. And because of that, there was further differentiation of the clades. So you can see that clade three there lurking in Eastern Asia, differentiating into clades three A and B. And as you might suspect, as the climate warmed, the ice melted, grizzly bears spread out. And notice the clade three bears heading east into Beringia. Our clade four bears spread east and started to spread north. So bringing this back home, we're fast forwarding to the beginning of our current warm epoch, the Holocene, about 11,500 years ago. The ice sheets were in rapid retreat. There was an ice-free corridor opened up and progressively widening. So we had a recolonization of eastern Beringia, what was to become Alaska, by these clade three grizzly bears. And they managed to slip through before the ocean levels, co the oceans coalesced, and we lost that land bridge. They headed south. Our clade four bears headed north, and they met and mixed in what was going to become Alberta, southeastern British Columbia. Now, importantly, the th clade three bears never got any further south. So, upshot is all of the bears that we once had at mid latitudes, that we continue to have at mid latitudes, are of this clade four lineage which is our descendants of the very first grizzly bears to get on this continent. Also, importantly, clade four grizzly bears have gone extinct everywhere else on Earth. The only place where we still have clade four grizzly bears is here at mid-latitudes, barring 
one small isolation, isolated population on the island of Hokkaido in Japan, which is testimony to how widespread this, one, this clade had once been. So here's how things settled out about 2,000 years ago before Europeans had arrived. I, that's a whole other story as to why we didn't have more grizzly bears further east and why we had this little isolated population up here. That's for another time. But anyway, clade three bears to the north, clade four bears to the south. So with that in mind, let's fast forward to when Europeans arrived. And more to the point, when Europeans first started encountering grizzly bears in significant numbers. So think Lewis and Clark. Here's where I reconstruct that we had grizzly bears in the contiguous US about 1800. So again, a pregnant period of time because this was when grizzlies and Europeans were first encountering each other. About 50 years later, grizzly bears had to been extirpated from the central and southern plains. Everything you see in yellow. About 60 years after that, we had lost grizzly bears in about 90% 90, 90 of the places that we had once had them. They were reduced to various small populations here denoted in green. Some of these so-called populations, no more than a handful of grizzlies at the time. 60 years after that, we were left with largely what we have now. Most of our grizzlies in the northern continental divide, greater Yellowstone, a few grizzlies in the North Cascades, and interestingly, a couple hanging on in the San Juans of Colorado last known grizzly in the San Juans, 1979. So we'd lost about 98% of bears that we once had numerically and 98% of the places they had once lived in a really short period of time. Why that happened? That's pretty straightforward. Um, Europeans with large caliber firearms, by some reckonings, bad attitudes, informed by narratives like Manifest Destiny which at least in the minds of our European ancestors gave themselves permission to perpetrate genocides of native peoples, wolves, bison, grizzly bears. Giving rise to this fairly tedious montage of photos from that epic of Europeans proudly standing over or beside grizzly bears that they had killed, perhaps most famously that grizzly bear in the lower right hand corner that, Grizzly, that Custer shot in the Black Hills, which is a place that I actually grew up. In fact, my, my cousin found this rock, so we were able to identify exactly where that had happened. So, at the macro scale, it's pretty obvious why we lost so many grizzly bears so quickly, but still leaving that question unanswered, why did we lose grizzly bears in central Idaho when they should have persisted? Which brings me to what I call the diet factor. So to understand how the diet factor plays out, we have to have a sense of dietary economies for grizzly bears at about the time of that first contact with Europeans. Everything you see here in green is where we have shrubs produce significant numbers of shrubs producing berries, and of course berries are a key bear food. The darker the green, the more diverse and abundant the berry-producing shrubs. And so in terms of the different dietary economies, we had a huckleberry-centered system farthest to the north. South of that, we had a system centered on spawning salmon and steelhead. Further east, we pick up a mountain economy, typified by foods such as white bark pine seeds, army cutmer moths. That's a whole other story. Further south yet, a system centered on the acorns of gamble oak for the most part, and further, furthest east out on the plains, a bison-centric system. So we know that spawning salmon and steelhead were critically important for grizzly bears because of the research done by, for example, Grant Hildebrand. He went around and collected tissues from the remains of grizzly bears that had been killed during the late 1800s, early 1900s, and using analysis of isotopes was to able to determine the fraction of the diet contributed by marine foods, meaning salmon and steelhead. 
And what he came up with was anything from 25 to 90 percent of all the assimilated energy and nutrients came from salmon or steelhead in this pinkish area. Hmm, so important. So focusing in again on, on Idaho, western Montana, far northwestern Wyoming, again these dietary economies. Look at where we have the grizzly bear promised land relative to where bears depended on salmon. Important point though, spawning salmon and steelhead were amply available to grizzly bears during pretty much the entire period of time that grizzly bears were being extirpated in this area. So it wasn't because we lost salmon or steelhead, at least not then. So, what was going on? Could it have been just simply numbers of people at that time? So here again, we have that distribution reconstructed by Seahart Merriam from 1910 relative to human densities. So the darker the orange, the more people. Not a very good match. We have this huge area where there were essentially no people other than a few ambitious miners, and we'd lost already most of our grizzly bears. Fast forward to 1930, still a pretty pronounced mismatch between where we had lost grizzly bears and where we have lots of humans, at least at that period of time. But look at the coincidence, again, between where we had this rapid anomalous extirpation and where we had salmon. So a clue as to what might have been going on comes again from William Wright. Now William Wright is credited with having single-handedly killed probably a hundred grizzly bears, most of them in central Idaho. And it turns out many of them, while they were long, spawning streams. So we know that where we have spawning salmon and steelhead, or salmon, that just about all the bears in a locale will be concentrated in specific areas at specific times, at low elevations, where most people are concentrated. And so we have vignettes like this one described by William Wright encountering a threesome of grizzly bears along a spawning stream. I accordingly fired at the small bear and hitting him square in the shoulder, he dropped promptly and without a murmur, but he dropped into the pool. Before the other one on the log had time to make much of an investigation, I hit him near the same place, but a little further back, and he made for the shore. I paid no attention to him, as I knew he was fatally wounded and would not go far, and slapping my third cartridge in place, he had a single shot. I turned to look for the third bear, but all I could see was the swaying of the bushes where he had disappeared. The second one shot went some 50 yards after reaching the bank when he fell and was quite dead when I got to him. This was not an anomalous incident. So you get, a, you get a sense of what was going on. So in contrast to salmon, we have foods like whitebark pine. Whitebark pine grows only at very high elevations. Whitebark pine produces high fat content seeds that are a critically important food for grizzly bears where those seeds are abundant. And so we know from places like Yellowstone that bears tend to be concentrated up where there's whitebark pine when that food source is abundant. Re referencing some of the work that Troy and I did, trying to explain where bears were extirpated and where they survived in the western US between 1850 and 1910, what we found interestingly was a surprisingly strong positive relationship between persistence of bears and where they had access to whitebark pine. So on this y-axis here, you can see the probability that grizzly bears would have survived in a given locale during two different transitions, 1850 to 1920, 1920 to 1970, relative to the local abundance of whitebark pine. And as you can see, a strong positive relationship. So I'm not going to exhaustively review all the evidence that pertains to the importance of diet, but you get the idea where we have foods like whitebark pine that are distributed to high elevations, that attract bears to high elevations, they tend to be fairly secure. They aren't exposed to many people. When we have foods such as salmon that attract bears to low elevations, they're more likely going to be exposed to people. 
And that becomes a big problem when those people are lethal. So we have basic formula. We have diet that governs exposure of bears to people, which together with human lethality, whether we're more lethal or less lethal, determines how many dead grizzly bears we have. So during that period of time between roughly 1850 and 1950, salmon increased the exposure of bears to people who were highly lethal. So it was not auspicious for the survival of grizzly bears. So paradoxically, and this is a paradox, <clears throat> losing salmon is probably a good thing insofar as restoring grizzly bears. So go figure. So you might think, okay, we've lost salmon. What are they gonna eat? What, the, what potential is there for bears? Well, I go back to this research. Everything in shaded in green has been reckoned potential suitable habitat for grizzly bears, looking at existing productivity, existing foods, existing remoteness from people. Here's the grizzly bear promised land. So what would bears be eating in this part of the world? Well, a lot of berries, for sure. There's that berry map. In the north, a lot of huckleberries, a lot of service berry. To the south, we pick up increasing amounts of choke cherry, buffalo berry. Whitebark pine, whitebark pine still hangs on in the south despite the effects of this lethal non-native fungal pathogen that I'm sure you've heard of, white pine blister rust. And then maybe army cutworm moths. <clears throat> army cutworm moths concentrate in alpine talus during the summer, and where we have concentrations of army cutworm moths, we have grizzly bears concentrating, concentrating there likewise and eating lots of them, up to 40,000 in a day. And they're little fat bombs. Now, we don't know whether we have any army cutworm moths, but it's an intriguing possibility, especially in the bitterroots. But more explicitly, people such as Mark Boyce have modeled where the productive habitat would be in specific areas, for example, within the Selway bitterroot recovery area, which is this red delineated area. So he looked at where that habitat might be during spring, summer, and fall, the darker the purple shading to red, the more productive the seasonal habitat. So you can see, as you might expect, the most productive habitat during spring in the northern part of the recovery area is down along the drainage bottoms. But then that productivity migrates upslope, up in elevation, to where then bears would be ever more remote from people. So here, are the greatest potential for conflicts here during summer and fall, the least everything else equal. But people have gone beyond that and actually predicted how many bears could live in different areas where we either have underoccupied or unoccupied ecosystems. So a guy named Garth Moat predicted how many bears could live in our various recovery areas where we have few bears. He said perhaps 450 inside the Selway Bitterroot recovery area alone, but notice that only encompasses a portion of the potential habitat. Mark Boyce came along and estimated something similar in the same ballpark, about 320. So Troy and I did our bit. We came up with roughly the same number for the cabinet yak potentially, about 100 bears there, if we were to achieve all of the existing potential. But we came up with something closer to 620 when we looked more comprehensively at that potential habitat in the promised land. So, pretty auspicious. Now that potential for grizzly bears to exist in the promised land has long been recognized. Despite the fact we have, no longer have grizzly bears there. It's recognized if for no other reason by virtue of the fact that the Fish and Wildlife Service identified a recovery area in the absence of grizzlies. And so recognizing that potential, the Fish and Wildlife Service moved ahead with an environmental impact statement that was organized around the prospect of reintroducing grizzly bears into central Idaho. It was produced in 2000. Key elements were experimental non-essential population, which went, that meant that the reintroduced bears would get essentially no protections. There would be no restrictions on resource extraction activities, so no effects on timber harvest, um, grazing, mining, 
25 grizzly bears would be essentially helicoptered in over a five-year period, and there'd be a citizen management committee. And interestingly, disproportionately, by some reckonings, um, populated by people representing resource extraction industries. Now, that plan, though, sank between the Scylla and Charybdis of emerging national and regional politics. That was about the time that G.W. Bush was elected president. Uh, Dirk Kempthorn, Kempthorn, who happened to be, happened to be uh, president of the student body here at the University of Idaho when I was going to school for my undergraduate, was governor of Idaho, um, quoted as saying things such as, I do not want to see an antisocial flesh-eating animal brought into Idaho. <laughs> Sounds like a human to me, but anyway. <laughs> Anyway, so that recovery plan or that reintroduction plan sank under the weight of those inauspicious political currents. Now, you could say a lot about whether that was a good plan, but just looking at the pragmatics of how likely we were to succeed with establishing a pop population dropping in 25 bears over a five year period, we have some data to draw on. We can go to the Cabinet Mountains up in northwestern Montana, where we have a very, very small population of grizzlies barely hanging on, and they've tried to augment that population. And so we have some results that may be germane. They dropped in 19 bears over a 17-year period. So a similar number of bears over a much longer period of time, though. Of those, only two successfully reproduced. So we have about a 15% success rate. Um, hard to know how that extrapolates exactly to what was being planned for central Idaho, but not very auspicious. So we could conceivably have dropped 25 grizzly bears into this ecosystem and had only two successfully reproduce. Moreover, under auspices of that EIS, as well as the overarching grizzly bear recovery plan, we would have relegated bears to perpetually isolated island populations of a few hundred bears each. None of those populations would be large enough to ensure long-term viability, surrounded by a veritable sea of alligators. So more to the point though, we don't need to drop bears into this ecosystem. Robust restoration natural restoration is not only possible, it is happening. Potentially. So if we realized all of that potential suitable habitat that I mapped out, this is what we could have. Everything in dark green here would be something that I would call core grizzly bear habit, habitat or core grizzly bear distribution. Everything that's light green, um, peripheral distribution capable of supporting a certain number of resident reproducing grizzly bears. That's a lot of country. And grizzly bears are showing us with their own feet that they are able to realize that potential. Each one of those lavender dots represents a documented, dispersing, colonizing grizzly bear. They are connecting the populations on their own. Just a matter of whether they stay alive or not. And we could have connectivity, natural connectivity emblematic of what is underway, we have the bear that showed up in Steven, Stevensville on a golf course on the very doorstep of the Selway Bitter Recovery Area. According to the managers, that bear was exhibiting poor etiquette <laughs> because it was digging divots in the golf course in pursuit of earthworms. Now that's interesting because the only place in North America where I had known grizzly bears to consume earthworms was in Yellowstone. The only other place on earth where I knew grizzly bears or brown bears had consumed earthworms was in Russia. So this was the second instance. And the point of that is that grizzly bears will probably show us that there's a lot more grizzly bear food in the world than we would credit, including earthworms. So we could have more grizzly bears. 
Um, some people would argue we should have more grizzly bears. Are there other reasons why we should pursue a more robust restoration? Sort of getting to this question of, so how many are enough? Well, you can answer that in many different ways. You can just simply look at history. For example, that history of extirpations here in graphic form is my reconstruction of the population of grizzly bears in the western contiguous United States. Around 1800, we had close to probably 60,000 grizzly bears. In a short 60-year period of time, we lost 98% of those bears. Since the bears have been given Endangered Species Act protections, we've recouped just about 1% of all of those former losses. So I would just put a question mark here, is that recovery? In light of the magnitude of the losses, I would probably say no. Also, there's an emerging consensus based on scientific research regarding what we likely need in terms of a minimum viable population. How many bears we need to ensure long-term genetic demographic viability. And that a consensus that has emerged since roughly the mid-1990s has been we need probably around 9,000. So we currently have about 1,700 in six isolated populations, absent bears in the Selway Bitterroot. So roughly 20% of probably what we should have ideally. Um, again, in a fragmented distribution. Now, when I start throwing around numbers like 9,000 grizzly bears, people, people start raising their eyebrows like holy schmagolies. <laughs> Is that even possible? Well, we need to look at the big picture. Here you're seeing the Canada-United States border. Here the totality of current grizzly bear distribution, everything in dark green is what I would call core distribution. As it stands now, everything light green peripheral distribution, you can see Yellowstone down isolated in the lower right-hand corner. Here's our current recovery areas. And again, this is what we could potentially have. Um, two populations, two different areas that are especially key from my perspective to realizing this potential. One is what I call the heart of the grizzly bear nation, the northern continental divide ecosystem. This is predictably going to be the source of most of the disp dispersers, most of the colonizers, probably the ones that are going to get eventually, if not already, have gotten to central Idaho. And then, of course, the grizzly bear promised land. You put that all together, and absolutely, we could have more than 9,000 grizzly bears as part of a contiguous population demographically, potentially stretching all the way from Yellowstone up to the Yukon. So it is imminently possible. You just have to think beyond the Canada border. So finally, okay, so we have all this potential. By some standards, it might be desirable to realize that potential. Even, there might even be an imperative to realize that potential. How do we do it? What are the pragmatics? So bridging the Great Divide. So here's that potential. Here, additionally, are dispersal routes that have been modeled by various researchers, everything in burgundy, shading to orange. Here again, where we currently have grizzlies. Here again, those documented dispersers, colonizers. Here are our current recovery areas. You put that all together and you can identify pieces of country, geography, that would be a logical focus of attention, what I call connective habitat or connectors. And you can even give them names, as I have done here. And there's different recommended measures, different things that might need to be done in these different connectors to realize the potential that I've described. Um, when it comes to any of the connectors that intersect, intersect with the state of Idaho, a certain management practice by Idaho Fish and Game is thrown into sharp relief, and that is bear baiting. So unlike Montana, where baiting of black bears has been prohibited, Idaho continues to allow the practice. Now you can see why that would be a problem because you are going to be attracting grizzly bears likewise 
to places where you have people with guns ready to kill a bear. Now, a lot of black bear hunters would claim that they can reliably differentiate a grizzly bear from a black bear. Um, notably, that grizzly bear that was killed in Kelly Creek, could say it was by, because it was a hunter from Tennessee, was a guy who was black bear hunting over bait. So this is predictably going to be a problem. Uh, roads are a problem for grizzly bears. So here again, that map of roads, uh, focusing in on the roads that are on forest service jurisdictions. So everything here max, masked out as yellow. Um, so here are the connectors where we have overlap almost entirely with forest service jurisdictions where there are existing already high road densities. Now we know that roads are a problem for grizzly bears. There is a huge amount of evidence, compelling evidence, that where you build roads, you're more likely to have dead grizzly bears. Just one bit of evidence from the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem in Montana. Here what we're looking at in Burgundy and Orange are lands on Forest Service jurisdictions where we either have industrial scale timber production in Burgundy, where we have dense open network, networks of open roads, or in Orange, where we have potential suitable habitat, some number of roads. So overlay on that, the black dots, all the known locations where a grizzly bear died between 2004 and 2014. Now, just on the basis of visual inspection alone, you can see that there is a disproportionate concentration of dead bears in these roaded landscapes on public lands. So managing roads, managing access matters if it comes to survival of grizzly bears. And we know how to deal with road management. We can just simply install barricades, any number of things. Private lands are predictably going to be an issue. The federal government doesn't have much jurisdiction over what happens on private lands. So these connectors logically throw private lands into relief, especially agricultural landscapes, the Sapphire, Pioneer, and Centennial connectors. Everything in red in total are these agricultural landscapes that are going to be of consequence to bears establishing connectivity somewhere between an ecosystem. Bears don't need to die in agricultural landscapes. That's a fact. And we know that just simply because of what's happened in one drainage, the Blackfoot River drainage on the southern end of the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. There was a landowner group that constituted, constituted itself called the Blackfoot Challenge. They brought themselves together to deal with resource challenges, weed management, water management, but they were pre-positioned to deal in a positive and proactive way to grizzly bears when grizzly bears started to show up. Here's the Blackfoot River drainage. Each one of those red dots is where a colonizing grizzly bear was documented during the late 1990s into the early 2000s. A predictable concentration of conflicts along the riparian areas, organized around agricultural attractants, such as calves, beehives, boneyards. Boneyards are just where a rancher will dispose of a carcass of an animal that had died for any number of reasons, often um, in a draw behind the ranch house. So again, these people responded positively and proactively. They deployed an extensive coexistence infrastructure, lots of electric fencing around beehives, calving areas, innovations such as livestock comp carcass composting. So you take your dead animals, put them in a secure, secure facility, and compost them. All of this with pretty dramatic positive results. So each one of these gray dots represents the number of conflicts per year in the Blackfoot River drainage, and you can see there was an exponential increase culminating in 2003, which is about when this coexistence infrastructure was deployed, after which we saw about a 90% decline in conflicts at the same time that levels of grizzly bear activity in the drainage continued to climb. 
So this is a dramatically positive example of what can be done. Dead bears are not inevitable. And fortuitously, at least by some reckonings, the Blackfoot Challenge sat astride all these dispens di potential dispersal routes. And so each one of these documented dispersing colonizing grizzly bears here, again denoted by these lavender dots, I would argue that most of those originated in the Blackfoot River drainage. So some people might say, well, thank you very much. But I would, I would say, I would argue that it was because of those positive measures taken in that area that we have these bears spreading out and occupying that potential suitable habitat. So more or less to wrap up, I thought Gary Larson kind of essentialized human grizzly bear coexistence. I don't know if you can read the text here, but you're looking at a couple of mountain men. This guy with one missing arm has obviously raised this grizzly bear from a cub. <laughs> and he's saying, yep, I raised the old girl from a cub I did. Of course, we had to get a few things straight between us. She don't try to follow me into town anymore, and I don't try and take her food bowl away until she's done. <laughs> now, I mean, I think the point here is that here we have one intelligent omnivore, and here we have another intelligent omnivore. We can both learn. We can learn to live with grizzly bears, and grizzly bears can learn to live with us. It's not rocket science, actually. We have lots and lots of practical tools, and I've identified just a few of them. But I would argue that it really is going to come down to what goes on between our ears, the stories we tell ourselves. If we continue to tell ourselves stories of domination, of intolerance, of violence, as our European ancestors did, yeah, there's no way that this potential be, will be realized, that we will achieve what I would consider to be meaningful recovery of grizzly bears. On the other hand, if we continue to increasingly tell ourselves stories as we are of accommodation, of compassion, of tolerance, of even relatedness, we'll be able to get there.